I am going to bring up our special guest, Esther Marker. Uh, sure. So within Second Life, you have like a school. Right. So, so, um, so I have, so for every wedding, uh, you can see those raised lights, they already I'm going to go ahead and let people in. So let's have fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Let's go. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, guys. Welcome to this Sunday afternoon early edition of Meet the Miniaturist. Hope everybody is doing well. Definitely use the chat box. You know the scoop. Um, I actually started a little early just to get folks activated and on before I start to, to uh, at least talk about some of the housekeeping and then, of course, bring on our special guest. So welcome, welcome. Say hello in the chat box. Tell me where you are joining us from. Um, hey, Illinois. Good to see you, Michelle. Great to see you. I think, I don't know. Did I have one last week? I think I was off last week. Hey, Louisville. Hi, Nancy. Princeton. We love Princeton. Um, how is everybody doing? Evelyn, so good to see you. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan Farnick. Oh my God. It's, you know, every week is like, kind of like coming home and seeing friends. So good to see everybody. Thank you guys for joining. Um, let me do a couple of, um, uh, you know, in case you're, you're new to this and you are, I would love to know in the chat box if you've never been to one of my Meet the Miniaturists, but I'm all about raising awareness of miniatures as a fine art form. That's what I do, but I also sell miniatures. And so, um, you know, that that is what I do. <laughs> and so if you've got an estate or a collection of miniatures that you're interested in selling, definitely reach out um, and, and and let me know and we can have a chat. Um, Donald, Donald's on with us. Say, say hello to... Um, Donald, please shout out to Donald, who is so great helping. Um, he's going to put my information in the chat box, which, you know, you guys can screenshot that, or I think you can click on it too, um, if, if you want to um, save it. But uh, just note that, uh, you know, I have a couple of Meet the Miniatures have, to have, to have just been posted on my YouTube channel. going to put that in, um, including my uh, Let's Talk About Doll Housing in the 2020s which uh, was sponsored by HBS, miniatures.com. Thank you very much, HBS. Um, and I also had an Instagram live with Tracy Ildama. She's a diorama artist. She does a lot of urban work, um, reproductions of very famous uh, storefronts and restaurants. Um, that's also you know, on my YouTube channel. And then coming up, and please, you're going to want to not miss this, next Sunday, um, August 15th, I am going live to the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City to uh, interview on a Meet the Miniature, a special museum edition, the curator of the Joanna Fisher Dollhouse exhibition. Her name is Caroline Hanna, and um, she's gonna chat with us. She's gonna show us, we're gonna get a personalized tour of the dollhouse. This is a special evening edition. So it's Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, next week. Uh, this is crazy exciting. For so many reasons, um, not only is the exhibition awesome, but um, we're gonna get a we're gonna get a tour from the curator herself, and we're gonna talk. We're gonna we're gonna do a deep dive. We're gonna we're gonna definitely see the dollhouse, but we're also gonna pick her brain about miniatures as a fine art form, and um, I'm gonna talk to her about why are miniatures so important in the art world today. Um, and then we're gonna also be joined by Joanna Fisher herself. So that is gonna be crazy exciting. Um, and we're going to talk to her about her passion for miniatures and why she was so inclined to, during the pandemic, create this beautiful dollhouse. So details to follow. Um, you actually you can check on my website. I've got the link to register. So you can go re register now for it. And then finally, in terms of Meet the Miniaturist and another sort of great, exciting like thing to even mention, but on August 31st, Tuesday, August 31st, also evening, 7 p.m., 7 p.m., I am gonna be interviewing the folks over at the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. I don't know if you guys know, but Walt Disney was a maniac like you and I. So we're gonna be chatting with the folks over at the Walt Disney Family Museum. And we're gonna be, um, we're, we're gonna be getting an insider's view of Walt Disney and his love of miniatures. So you're not gonna wanna miss that. That registration link's not up. That's why you have to get on my link. You have to get on my web, you have to get on my website and, uh, and, and get on my email trail, trail because that's how you find out about stuff. Okay, and then finally, and then we're gonna get to our, uh, actually it's two things. 
if you love what you're seeing and you want to contribute to, to the development of this series, the Meet the Miniature series, please go ahead and contribute and become a member of my patrons club. Um, we're just getting started on this patrons club, which is all about exclusive content, um, meet and greets uh, virtually, and um, unique programming for sort of the uh, contributors and the patrons of this channel. So you're going to want to link there, make a contribution, and then you automatically become part of the patrons club. So do that. Um, and then finally, 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 and this is just a tease. Um, see that behind me? I'm not going to go too deep in there, but it is a beautiful colonial room box, 1776, uh, circa 1776, um, that is part of an estate sale that I'm working on. I mean, we're about eight weeks out, but um, and I don't use this word lightly, but um, this is going to be an estate sale of an extraordinary collection of fine miniatures from some of the finest artists in the world, if not the universe, not the, we'll take the world. Um, so details to follow on that, uh, but you're gonna wanna look, you're gonna wanna look out for this because I'm putting this collection together for sale and oh my God, my heart palpitates when I, uh, when I do it. So sign up on my website for updates so you never miss an update. And, and with that, um, I am going to bring up our special guest, Esther Marker. Um, so just a little bit about Esther before we chat with her. Esther is a, uh, uses 3D technology uh, to make some of the most beautiful miniatures I've seen. And there's Esther, yay! Hi! Thank you. Um, so Esther, <laughs> I was just doing a little pre-introduction of you, um, but All right. you know, I do wanna say, you know, I, I found you just like I find a lot of the other miniaturists online. And I'm just so, so fascinated by your account not only because of the beautiful work you do, but because you share your techniques and, and, and thoughts around how to. So you really is, you're giving in so many ways, not only your art, but your thoughts and your knowledge. And we're gonna talk a lot about that today. So we have a, we have, um, we're gonna get into who you are. We're gonna get into looking at your work. And we're also gonna get a little bit of how you do what you do to create some of these beautiful miniatures. But before, but let's, let's start at the beginning because you have an interesting story to tell in terms of you were not always a miniaturist. So you wanna start there and tell us like, what were you doing and how did you get to where you are now? Both physically and, you know, because you had a physical move in your life. So let a, let's hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I started to be a lawyer of all things. And um, I, um, there was always like this artist in me that was sort of struggling to get out. I mean, I would I would use, you know, my, my time in college and in law school to, to paint, you know, oil on canvas was basically my medium at that point. And um, yeah, but then I figured if I would go to law school. I mean, it, it didn't help that I had parents that told me that all artists only got famous after they died. <laughs> and I would probably be you know, starting in an attic somewhere if I, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't go the law route. So, well, I did study law and I enjoyed my profession and I was, um, you know, it was, it was marine law, maritime law, arresting ships. Yes. So, um, yeah, I was, I was doing that and I was, um, I liked it. I enjoyed it. But then I, I got married and I moved to a very small, a smaller city than, than Mumbai, which is where I'm from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, there was no high court in Trivandrum here. So I couldn't uh, practice my specific branch of law. So I started looking, you know, I was bored. I was dabbling in a little bit of this and dabbling in a little bit of that, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be, actually. I had realized I had to re reinvent myself or I would drive my husband absolutely crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I got a dollhouse mm. and uh, I started to, you know, I, but, you know, more than, you know, it was such a daunting, huge undertaking because I picked up the Garfield, yeah. which was, I think, nine rooms or 11 rooms or just something massive. I should have started with the room box. So yeah, um, I think that I enjoy doing the little parts, you know, making things for it without actually having to electrify, God forbid, or, you know, put up wallpaper or anything like that. Right. So, um, yeah, then I started to sculpt, I started to paint, I started to do miniature paintings, miniature icons, miniature Venetian no. masks. So wait, you're moving too quickly. So, so did you <laughs> grow up with a dollhouse? Where did the interest in miniatures come from? Um, actually a book I read, uh -huh. a book I read while I was studying law. Really? What was the book? Of so, yeah, it was Virginia Merrill. 
Okay. One of the one of the old books, mainly black and white, you know, featured the uh, Thorn Rooms, um, Queen Mary's Dollhouse. Ah, right, right, right. And, yeah, and uh, we had a couple of really good bookstores near about where I grew up, so I buy books on dollhouses, look at them, you know, but never really had the the time, you know, college was hectic, yeah. then my, my, my law school was hectic, getting getting into um, becoming a lawyer was hectic. So right, was, yeah. right. So, so, did, so did you have a dollhouse growing up or no? No, 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 no dollhouse growing up. My, my first dollhouse was actually the coffee and when I moved to Trivandrum and was I like looking for something to do. Just curious, where is that now? Because I know that it, it is an overwhelming task if you if you get a dollhouse that's, you know, nine rooms for your first one out. It's overwhelming and it could be very defeating. So is, is it a sitting? Are you, where is that in your no, world? No, I, I, I gave it away because I, it, it's, it, you know, we, we, moved home, we moved house from a couple of times since, the, yeah. you know, since the original location of that dollhouse. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then it's sort of, fell apart. I didn't rhyme it properly. The wallpaper started to peel off. And this is another reason why I'm daunted about, you know, just doing a very large piece like that. Yeah, yeah. I'd just rather start some start with room boxes. And um, then, you know, one of the things I, I got into yeah. uh, was something called Second Life. Ah, yes. Tell us about that. Um, it's, it's, it's like this 3D parallel world. Okay, where you live your life as an avatar. Mm -hmm. an avatar. So there's like this, yeah, a walking, talking, mini representation of you. Right, and that's uh, all that virtual, can... and it's all online. It's this whole world that's online, yes. but it's creative in the sense yes. that you get to build these characters, these 2D characters. Is yes, right? 2D, uh, 2D, no, you, you, it's, it's a 3D character, but uh, the character is given to you by Second Life. You have to make it look by by putting like a skin on it. You know, okay. you reskin it. Yeah. So that was what that was what I was doing. I had a business there called Skin Within. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, I would I would make um, yeah so, a character from Africa, one from India. You know, sort of represent the whole world in my store. But this is not a and, physical, uh, tangible character, right? It's all virtual, right? It's all virtual. All it's virtual. all virtual. Okay. I mean. Not that I could ship something to somebody, it's all but online. people would come. Yeah, people would come into the shop and actually pay me money to buy my skins, so they Got could it. look in a certain way, and they could go shopping, they could go to malls, they could go dancing, they could I they know. could also build build things, you know. So I love the creative elements of Second Life. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, you could you could actually walk into these places called sandboxes, where a whole bunch of a community of builders are creating. So somebody is building a house, somebody else is building furniture, somebody is texturing something, somebody is putting um, paint on a dress. To you know, you have like make a red, blue, green, and yellow version of the same dress. Yeah. So it was like you know, I was like, wow, I want to be a part of this. I want to, I want to be able to do this. I want to join these people. Sure. So within Second Life, you have like a school where you could, you know, go to, go into various. It was not a class, but it was like a display. Yeah. So, so let me ask and, you. So, so, but there came a time when the the virtual flat world um, d became less interesting to you and you moved on to working in 3D. Is that right? And actually creating, yeah, that's absolutely right. but taking all of that knowledge, working virtually, creatively, moving it over to 3D and working in 3D and something specifically that you, um, were inspired by, uh, were, were the antique Tiffany lamps. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I mean, once, once I sort of got my feet wet with 3D printing, yeah. Oh, um, I kept I kept asking myself, okay, I mean, I I'm a miniaturist, and how can I how can I use three D printing to to make something smaller, you know? And for the longest time, I've always thought about these Tiffany lamps and how how it could be replicated. You know, I even it even went so far as to buy um you know microscope slides. Yeah. Yep. Which are Ooh, very glass. very thin and then. Yeah, but these are the cover slips on the slides. So they are like, you know, each one is like a point one millimeter. So yeah. 10 of them will make a millimeter. And, uh, you know, figuring out how to cut them, paint them, and then, you know, attach them into some kind of a shape. It was, it was completely crazy. 
So yeah. with the so I, we, with we actually printing. have a, a we have a video which I'd love to share that you put together of the actual process right. of how you actually right. create. So let me share that and take us through what we're actually seeing uh, right. while, while I'm showing you that. All right. Because I think it's hard to, to really grasp when just hearing it. You have to actually see it, folks. So I hope everybody can see this. I'm playing it now. So this is Esther's taking us through how she actually creates these beautiful pieces. So, so this is my inspiration. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm going to be, I've, I've drawn that little blue squiggle you see over there, which is actually a closed shape. And I've converted that into the outline of the cherub chandelier. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the dome part. It, so is that the okay. real, that's the one in real life that you're working off of? Oh, uh, no, that's a photograph. That's, that's a, photograph a photograph of the one, yeah, yeah. And um, I've put together a whole bunch of shapes, leading. Okay, and I've created the chandelier. I mean, oh. this is how I cure it under a UV light. This right. is the miniature version. Right. It's come off the printer and it's being cured. Mm -hmm. Now, my very first step in painting these is the priming. Mm -hmm. So I, I use um, I use a primer by Badger. What's it say that again? It's what a primer by a, a company called Badger. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, the painting process is, uh, first I'll outline the leading. If uh, you can see those raised lines, yeah. they already form part of the design. Mm -hmm. Right. So all I have to do is go over it with a, a permanent marker. In this case, I'm using a gold Sharpie. Mm -hmm. Wow. And sort of bring bring out the design. This also helps me, you know, decide on what colors I want to fill into the individual recesses. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to get the name of that primer again in, in so that it's, we can... it's by Badger, B-A-D-G-E-R. Badger, got it. Badger, yeah. I'm yeah. asking for it. Badger so right. so right. you do the That's outlining right. of the lead first. And just by the way, so people know, the 3D printer is what is gives you those tiny lead lines that are almost embossed or debossed or that That's create right. that That's texture. Right. I, right, right. I, I create the lines in the 3D software so then they transfer onto the final print. Wow. So do you know the colors you're gonna use or do you, do you just do you wing it like what? <laughs> well, I, I have a basic idea for palette, and then I wing it. And so then you wing I it. I say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to do this one in browns and ambers and blues. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I'll sort of create a couple of, you know, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll pull out the paints in those colors, and then I'll start, uh, yeah, just working working on shapes, yeah. and then you know, and as I work, I could change my mind. I, I could perhaps say that no, next to this particular color, I don't like that. I might want to use something else. Right. So it's a it's a process that changes as I go along, but I have a more I, I more or less have an idea of which colors I want to use. Right, and you you do use special paints for this, correct? Special glass glass paint. Glass paint. That's glass right. Paint. And talk a little bit about what I find fascinating is that you, the three D printer gives you that sort of translucency that you need when you lay the color down. The the translucency I get by using clear resin. Oh. Oh, Resin yeah. comes in all sorts of colors. So oh. I, I, I use the clear by the company Any Cubic. Right. Okay. And um, I like the clear because it's it doesn't it doesn't yellow like mm -hmm. other resins can. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like a color, can you redo it over it or no? Oh, uh, you mean the paint? The paint yeah, color? let's say you painted a, a panel. Yeah, yeah, there is, uh, you, I could while it's still wet. If it dried, then I could not. Right. So uh, we did get a question. I don't know. Can we take a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Heather sure. wants to know if you paint with a needle, but it looks like you use a very thin brush. No, that's actually a brass toothpick. <gasps> what is it? A brass what? A, a brass toothpick. No. Oh my goodness, I'm seeing it now. So yeah, you do. You use a a, a a tooth a pin. Oh my goodness, I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's it's a pin. <sighs> Just look at how 
little paint you deposit on there. It's just, so did it take you a while before you sort of developed the technique? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, a couple of tries, definitely. And um, well, I, you know, when I started painting, I didn't, I, didn't I didn't think about the glass paint. I started using something called alcohol ink. Oh yeah, yeah, alcohol ink. You know, sure. uh, I had, I had a bunch of them lying around and I said, hey, these are, they're supposed to be good on glass. But I didn't, I didn't like the way they sort of turned opaque once they were dry. They lost their transparency, their translucence, they lost everything, you know, in the process of drying. Right. And it became this uh, very, very dull, non-shiny thing. And then somebody suggested that this, this is looking, looking good in theory, but you should put, put a coat of varnish on it, you know, bring out a gloss in some way. Uh -huh. And I tried that and the, you know, the, the lead sort of didn't work well with the varnish. Right. And I had this, this mess on my hands that, you know, colors just going everywhere. And, ah, it was, so there have been, there have been some, you know, some ups and downs in the process. Of course. Of course. And, and, and to be fair, every, um, you know, every piece I make, make will not always work on the first bow. It will, it will be, it will be, it will be a process of, you know, um, okay. Um, are the wiring channels open? For me, that's very important. Is there, right. is there a way to hide the wires? Very often when you create a light of say, you know, like the parrot chandelier, which I made, I had six different wiring channels and they all had to be open. So it, yeah. it took a couple of retakes to, to get that going to make sure that the, the, you know, the channels were large enough to have the wire pass through and still small yeah. enough that, you know, it would fit within that shape. Yeah, can, actually, can you talk a little bit about the lighting that you use? Um, is it LED? Is it trans? Uh, is it uh, more incandescent? No, incandescent. It's, it's an incandescent um, grain of rice bulb. One more time. Oh, I, like, I like the soft. I like the soft glow it gives. Um, yeah. LEDs are very a uh, very now, and it's yeah. definitely something I sh I need to look at because they have the um, you know they don't they last a lot longer. And yeah. uh, they don't need to be rewired. Could we, I just want to make, I want to take a second so people can just actually look at this for a second. <laughs> that is just stunning. It is just stunning. <laughs> um, let me take another, another question because these are really good questions. Um, right. To, 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 resin, we should talk about the resin. Oh, is it resin? No, it's not resin paint that she was saying. You use glass paint. Glass, glass paint, that's right. And the other question was, is this a 3D resin printer? Yes, you do use resin, but a specific type of resin, right? Yeah, by, by the company Anycubic. And yes, it is a 3D resin printer. Um, and do you seal the finished painting? We talked about that. You don't seal them. No, I don't. I, I, I seal the metal bits, but I don't seal the glass. Got it. Can you talk a little bit about the weight? They look pretty light. They have a weight. Uh, they 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 are, they're definitely not metal. Okay, mm. but but they definitely they're not plastic. So yeah. they are, they're definitely more weighty than plastic, but yeah. perhaps not as heavy as a metal piece would be. Right. So let's talk a little bit about how long it takes you to make a piece. I mean, just, I mean, how, let's talk about how the, the process of designing and then actually, you know, getting it through the printer and then actually decorating and coloring and shading. I mean, that's a huge process. Right, right. So, well, I start, I start with the photograph, you know, something that inspires me or, you know, something I want something to look like, or, you know, somebody may have challenged me, hey, can you do this? So, you know, I'll start with that. And initially, a lot of it is a mental process, which is, you know, going on in my head and trying to figure things out. And uh, finally, I'll, um, I'll open up Shape of 3D, which is the app I use. Uh -huh. And um, I'll start with uh, drawing a few lines, and, you know, try to, try to create an outline for what it is I want to do. So uh, this process, you know, start to finish could, could take, yeah, a couple of weeks, perhaps. Weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine this is quite a process. Um, right. So Heather has a good question about scale. I mean, it looks like you're working in one twelve scale for the most part. Do you work in other scales? No, I, I prefer, I prefer one twelve because it gives me, it's, it's, it's just big enough for me to, you know, be able to put in the level of detail that I want. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's not, 
too big where you know my you know you my printers may not be able to accommodate it because resin printers are smaller than yeah. uh, FP printers. Yeah. So okay, I mean, I think this is just this is just incredible. I love it. I'm gonna now, go ahead. And what you're now seeing, Darren, is the other version of the same chandelier without the blending. We'll say that again. It's a version of the same sheriff chandelier, but oh. without the leading lines on the on the door. Oh, oh, I didn't realize that. So we're looking at a it's, different version. It's a different version, yeah. So I decided to finish this one in a shabby chic um, oh. copper, as you can see. We're we're gonna get to talking about how you do take custom commissions and all of that, but it's amazing how you have different variations that you can offer, which is pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. All right, I'm going to stop the share because we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to get to see some of your awesome work in a second. The questions are great. Keep them coming. Clearly, this is an engaged group. Christine wants, Christine is saying she bought two of your peacock lamps. I saw the peacock lamps. They're beautiful. Um, so this is just accolade, just great, great thoughts around your work, which is great. Diane wants to know, is the 3D programming the most difficult part? Actually, what is the most challenging part for you? Um, yes, no, definitely the yeah. definitely the design process, uh, the the 3D process, and then bringing it into the real world. Because you know, until it, the design may be great, but until it's actually printed and I'm able to hold it in my hands, and there's no failures in the process, that only then I know that my those those hundred hours of design work have actually succeeded. I yeah. wouldn't know before it's actually printed. Right. So what people might not know is you actually you also make art dolls that are three, and I just learned this myself, that are 3D sculpted. So talk a little bit about yes. that because that work, and we're seeing it right now. If you guys can see, we put brought up another video of, of her work. We're gonna, we're gonna swing over to the other piece, but look at the art dolls. Oh. And, and here's the thing. And I was, telling, uh, I was telling Esther this before we began, which is, you know, we've been talking about 3D technology for a long time, at least for the last five years. And, you know, um, the big question is, how do we merge 3D technology with fine art miniatures? And I and what I'm so struck by is I think for the first time I'm, I'm actually seeing with Esther's work, this merging of technologies that's actually creating fine art miniatures, what we're calling fine art miniatures. So I just, I love what I'm seeing. I love the techniques you're using and the technology. And we're actually finally seeing this technology brought to life in a way that we haven't seen before. So kudos to you, um, you. Esther and the work that you're doing. So I, I just love it. I love it. I love it. So yeah. So let's see some of the beautiful lamps. I don't know if you have that peacock lamp there because I've, that's crazy. Awesome. I do. I do. <gasps> yes. <laughs> All right. Is that clear? Yes, it is. So the peacock is the the lower left hand, right? That's right. Oh. Yeah, so, and then there's the bird chandelier in the center. Would you want to take us through the different pieces that you have there? Yeah, yeah. Let me, should I perhaps go a bit closer? Yeah. Okay, so this awesome. one, yeah, this one is the plain version of the cherub chandelier. Yep, beautiful. Okay. Ugh. Here we have the peacock chandelier. I'm uh, sorry, the parrot chandelier. The parrot chandelier. Six lights, right? Ugh. Six lights and one in the dome, so seven. Can you show the dome? Because the dome is, it's all incredible, but I mean, can you get under there and show that the the jewel tones and the work on the painting? Is that? Yeah, no, yeah. we can definitely see more of it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> We aren't seeing what you're showing. Okay, hold on a second. Folks are not seeing it. So I don't know why hey. I'm not seeing it. Are some guys in the chat box, are some of you seeing the work and some of you aren't? Because that might be a lo local issue. Okay, good. Local issue, guys. So check your, your own videos. Okay, thank you. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the cherub light. Oh, God. That's another version of the cherub light. Is that a third? That's, oh, that's, I see it. I see yeah, it. this one, this, this one is the uh, one with the blending, the Tiffany style. Right. Oh, man. If, if I had to buy one, I would not be able to figure out which one I want. <laughs> 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 it would be very difficult. Okay, beautiful. And then we have the, the Lotus lamp. Oh, this, is, this is an iconic Tiffany piece. Mm. Um, it was, I think, made in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It was called the, the Tiffany Mandarin Lotus Leaf Style Lamp. Something along those lines. <laughs> Beautiful. Paul is saying I should buy them all. <laughs> oh, and they, I love it. Oh, it's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Lovely. Really lovely. So, so, and we just, we saw, we've seen them, right? Is there any more? Yeah, that's it. Okay. So tell us about that there's, not only do you take commission work and sell pieces of, you know, that, that you create, um, but you also sell kits. Talk a little bit about the kits. Right, right. Well, you know, I think this, uh, I, I have so much of fun doing these pieces, painting them, you know, and working on them. So I figured that why not, you know, there would be some, you know, every, inside every dollhouse uh, miniaturist, there's also an artist. Yeah. Because, you know, they, everybody's got you know, doing their own wallpaper, their own painting, putting their houses together. Some, some are doing furniture, but buying other things uh, and vice versa. So there's a bit of a DIY in us all to some yes, extent. For sure. So um, I think that if I would offer this as kids, you know, people would also enjoy putting it together because once the piece is, piece is there, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to outline the leading lines with with permanent marker yeah. and paint the recesses with glass paint. The, the good thing about the leading is that it keeps the glass from, you know, it keeps it in its little receptacle area. Yeah. It doesn't have it spread all over the place. Yeah. So you can stay in line. You, you, won't, you won't go out of the lines. Right, right. Uh, yeah, no, that makes it very uh, user-friendly. Um, right. So, so, um, so I have, so for every piece that I made, uh, in fact, I won't even launch uh, a style uh, as, as a commission unless I also have the kids ready for it. Yeah. So um, question about, we're going back to the 3D printing. Is it all one piece or is it two pieces, like the lampshade and the base? Oh, uh, usually two pieces. Um, some, some like the cherub light, if I have to make it, I'll, you know, I'll put it together and ship it as a single piece. Yeah. But uh, the kids, the kids are all multiple parts. So at the very least, it's the, the base and the shade, okay? Uh, yeah. the, the parrot light has got about um, eight pieces. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the, yeah, well, each, the, the dome area, the, the chandelier stem and the six birds. Right. Lots of interest in the kits. We're going to share the link to your Etsy site. Um, but okay. also we should note that you have a Facebook group that you administrate. Is that that's right. a little bit about what that's about? Is it? But my Facebook group is mainly to, you know, to share the documentation, the videos, the techniques uh, oh. for the kids. So anybody that buys the kit gets invited into this group. Oh, I okay. love that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so then there's this one place where people who are making my, my kids can talk, you know, uh, even yeah. if I happen to be leap at that moment if somebody has a question and somebody else can answer that question uh, about paint or about frame or about just about anything there's you no know, there's really help available yeah and I love I, that and it's a group I very closely monitor and I'm there to answer questions all the time so you know it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah I love that you know Esther we, we need you here and teaching in the states because I could see this being a wonderful class just you know painting these beautiful lamps. I would just love to see that happen. We have to make that happen. We, we need to make yes, it. Yes, <laughs> um, But you know, the other thing is, may I suggest in the age of COVID is doing, doing you know, doing a virtual class. I would sign up for that. You ship, I, ship me the kit and just, you know, I'll, we'll do it all in a class. I think that would be wonderful. Um, so definitely I, that's a good idea. There. <laughs> one more question about technique is uh, about the glues that you use. Is there a special glue that you use for the resin? Um, like for example, the I don't I don't use glue on any of the lamps. Okay, in terms of because the lampshade fits directly over the lamp base and uh, it's it's all good. Mm -hmm. uh, the chandeliers, that is the, not the parrot chandelier, yeah. but the, the cherub chandelier, mm -hmm. the, the, the dome being the lower part, yeah. okay, um, needs, needs a way of attaching the chandelier stem to that. Got it. So I use, I use a gel-based super glue. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. 
Now this is this is a temporary hole, and then I take a little bit of UV resin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not not the three D printer resin. It's more of an um, epoxy resin yeah. which cures cures in under uh, UV light. Got it. So yeah. I'll I'll reinforce my glue joints with that and uh, put it under my UV light to cure. Yeah. So then it's really really secure. Well, lots of interest in a class, and I will share this chat box with you, Esther, but there's lots of, um, really lots of interest for the class and lots of nice notes about your work, for sure. So what, is, oh, what thank is, you all. <laughs> so what is next for you? What, what is sort of, uh, like, what are some of the things that you're thinking about doing? What would you love to be doing? Is there a project in the works that you want to share? Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got this idea <laughs> in my yeah. mind. Um, <laughs> called digital digital dollhouse oh keep going okay. and it's uh, it's I, I want to bring together you know artists that create uh digital files for miniatures Ooh. okay yeah. but only I'm, I'm only the miniatures the dollhouse community not the tabletop gaming not not that because those guys there's, there's plenty of them they already have a, a that's the whole other world, those guys. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So just, just for our community, you know, things like filler stuff like shelving and little jars and little glasses and little pots and little, you know, pans and kitchenware and, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so, that, so that these little filler items don't have to be bought all the time. They can be made by somebody with a 3D printer yeah. who, who just has to have access to this website, you know. A, a bunch of curated artists, 3D artists that will create these files, share them among the community, and uh, others can then buy and then, and then sort of, because uh, I think that very soon, everybody will have a 3D printer at home. It will, it will become a necessity. I mean, schools yeah. will require it, just, just as, you know, normal pancake printers are now required. They print sure. this out. And For sure. Earlier, we had to go to the coffee shops. Not, not anymore. We all have one at home. That's right. You're, I think you're right. You're right on it, right? You're, you're so spot on. I agree with you. Um, so let's see if, are there any other final questions before we let um, Esther go, guys? Any other questions? There is interest in, oh, love the idea of the digital dollhouse. And okay. we had a question about half scale kids. I know you love 112 scale. Any interest in, in half scale? Uh, unless I design a lamp from scratch to be half scale, um, it would be, it would, I wouldn't be able to take one of my current pieces and just say, let's scale it down. Yeah. There's a very good chance it may not work. The shades are very thin. They are not even a millimeter. Yeah. So That's, you yeah. go half scale with that. You, you might get holes. It would be too fragile to actually handle. Yeah. So it would, I could do it, but it would, it would need to be a design made for half scale and very simplified. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, as we wrap up, I just wanted to one more question. Oh, there's there's energy for bird cages and also stained glass windows. So maybe in the future we'll see some more work from you in that regard. <laughs> definitely, definitely on the stained glass windows. I'm already Great. thinking about something awesome. like that. Awesome, <laughs> beautiful. Esther, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and sharing your work with us and your techniques and technologies and all of this beautiful stuff. Thank you so much for bringing 3D technology into the sort of the modern miniatures world. And um, everybody out there, check out the links to her sites, check out her Etsy site, Facebook group, and of course her Instagram account, which has beautiful images that she's very on it, sending us, you know, showing us her work as it's as it's happening. So thank you again, Esther. This has been wonderful. Thank you guys Hi, Darren. at home. <laughs> Darren, thanks for having me on. It's My been pleasure. awesome. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, guys, have a great rest of your day, night and mornings. Bye.